So we have defined a functor, maybe. Maybe we have, maybe we haven't. Right? Because we have just defined the mappings. The mapping of objects, types, and mapping of morphisms or functions using F map. <coughs> but there were the additional conditions, right? Which are called functor laws sometimes, uh, which say that every functor must preserve composition and identity. Now, how do we know if this guy preserves composition and identity? Well, we cannot express this in Haskell. The compiler cannot check. Like there is, you know, we, we cannot, in, uh, in the type system, we cannot encode these conditions in Haskell. So, tough luck, right? However, unlike in other languages, there is a way of using Haskell on a whiteboard or blackboard to prove things about the language. Okay? Like formally prove. So, we would like to prove that this functor preserves identity. What does it mean? It means that fmap acting on id is equal id. Right? Now, this id uh, works kind of on a different object than this other id. Right? But it's okay. So if we put ID here, we should get ID on maybe, right? So if this is ID at some A, this is ID at maybe A. <clears throat> but it's a polymorphic ID, so you know, who cares? What where is defined? It's defined for every type by the same formula. Parametric polymorphism. And we want this to preserve composition. So that if we take an F map of F, or let's, let's say G after F, right? Consistent, that it should be the same as F mapping G dot F map F. Okay? So that's, that's this uh, diagram where we have F and G afterwards, right? And we map it and we get F map G. We map this, we have F map F, right? But we can also take the shortcut here G after F, and it should be mapped in the same way as F map G dot F, right? So this arrow should be the composition of these two arrows. That's what pre preservation of structure means in this case. So how do we go about it? Now, this is not really uh, Haskell because, I mean, in Haskell you can put an equal sign, but that's like, I mean, I'm defining a function, right? Here we, we are not defining a function. Fmap and ID are already defined. We are just saying these two functions are equal, right? What does it mean that functions are equal? Okay, well, they, are, they have equal values on equal arguments. So what's so special about Haskell is that every definition of a function in Haskell is an equality. It says like this function acting on this argument equals this expression, right? 
and it means what it says. These two things are equal. It's actually an equation. It means that left side is the same as the right side. So, in particular, you can replace the left, left side whenever you find it in a bigger program. If you find this function call, you can replace it with this expression, right? We know this trick from programming, it's called inlining, right? Now, inlining is not always correct, right? This is why compilers are very careful about inlining. And this is why, for instance, things like uh, C++ or C macros are so bad, because when you inline them and they have side effects, right, you get into trouble. But if you have pure functions, in Haskell, you have pure functions, you can do inlining safely. And you can do the opposite of inlining, right? This is, a, this is called refactoring. You find an expression somewhere and you say, I'm going to turn this expression into a function call. I'm going to lift this expression somewhere and say, define a function equals this expression, and then replace this expression everywhere, or in some places, by a function call. So these two things work in Haskell, and they're guaranteed to work. So we can use this in uh, what is called equational reasoning. We can, we can write stuff on, on the whiteboard and say, now I'm going to transform this by doing inlining or refactoring, right? And if I can show that through inlining and refactoring I'm getting from one result to another, it means that these two things are equivalent. That the semantics of this stuff is the same. So I want to do this for these two equations, right? I want to start with this, let's say, and do some equational reasoning, uh, namely replacing definitions by uh, the function definitions by the expressions that are used in their definition, right? So how do I do this? Um, okay, so fmap id. <coughs> this this is a uh, when fmap acts on id, it produces a function from maybe a to maybe a, right? Uh, so I have two cases to check. This maybe could be a nothing or it could be a just, right? Okay, so let's let's do this. Let's let's check. Um, so let's do equational reasoning in red. Let's say. <coughs> So fmap id acting on nothing. That's my first case. fmap id acting on nothing. Uh, fmap f on nothing is nothing by definition of fmap. Okay? I can use the definition of fmap. fmap f on nothing equals nothing. So this is equal nothing. Which, by definition of ID, I don't have a definition of ID here, right? But that's very simple. ID on X equals X. Okay? So nothing I can replace with ID nothing. See what I did here? I did refactoring. I saw an expression, nothing, and I say, oh, but nothing occurs here as an x. I can replace it with idx. I can replace idx with x, but I can replace any x with idx. So in particular, I can replace nothing with id nothing. Right? So, this acting on nothing checks. Okay, normally what you do is you don't do this refactoring thing. You just start burning the candle from both ends, right? So you say, okay, let me see what ID nothing is. ID nothing is nothing, right? What F map ID nothing is? Oh, it's nothing. So they, they come, come back in the middle. 
right? But, but if people write it down, they, they usually just want to go in one direction. So they, they start by, by inlining and then end up in refactoring or do a combination. <coughs> so that's one case, right? Now, what about fmap id acting on some just x, right? Uh, f map f on just x. Okay, let me use this definition then, right? Inline this guy. Uh, that will be that will give me just f x, where f is id. I'm replacing f with id, right? So I'm doing this substitution of arguments by by actual expressions. So id on x is just x. So this is equal just. Well, I can write it just id x, right? Which is equal just x. And now I can burn the candle from the other side, you know, so id acting on just x, right, is equal to just x. By definition of id. Okay? So using equational reasoning, I can show that this is indeed, indeed true. Now, I could go and do the same with, with this, with, with composition, right? But I think you can just look up my blog and it's, it's done there. So let's, let's just skip this. And by the way, funny thing is that this, uh, strictly speaking, I don't have to prove this. Because since we are using uh, polymorphism, parametric polymorphism, this becomes a theorem for free. This follows, it's enough to prove the ID property. Once the ID property is proven, this follows. Is that why we could return nothing for, uh, for just? Probably. Yeah. Okay. So, so much for equational reason, right? Just remember, you know, when you are programming in Haskell, you know, if you are defining a, a new functor, um, you might want to think about is this really a functor? Um, and then again, you might not, because in the next lecture, I will show you that most of the stuff that you come up with is automatically a functor, okay? And in particular, anything that you can do using algebraic data types, automatically functor. So you don't have to worry about it, okay? But there are other, you know, more complex things like when you define a monad, monad has its laws too. Just like functor has functor laws, monad has some more complicated laws. And actually you've seen, you've seen monad laws when, um, when we were talking about Kleisley arrows, right? The, the, the fish operator, you know? The, the fact that it's associative and that the, and then return is a unit of, of this uh, composition. And these were these additional laws. And if you wanted to prove these laws, you would go through some kind of equational reason. Okay. So that's, that's to satisfy our programmer cells. And then more, okay? Um, since we are in Haskell, uh, let, let's talk about how to define a functor in general in Haskell, right? Because I, I showed you one functor and I said, okay, all functors have this, this way of, um, well, it's called lifting, okay? Why, why is it called lifting? I, I, this, this picture here maybe is, is not a very representative picture. I should have turned it on, on, on its side, right? Let me turn it on its side and you will see why, why this is called lifting. So I have a function from A to B, that's F, right? 
And now A becomes maybe A. That's my functor. B becomes maybe B. And F is lifted by F. And it's called lifting because it's a buff. Okay, so we are using these uh, kind of <laughs> arguments from three-dimensional or, or even two-dimensional. Something is above, so it's lifting. So it's like the, these types that are obtained through endofunctors, they are above the, the original types. We take a function between these types, we lift it to a function. That's why it's called lifting. So a functor defines lifting of functions. Okay. Uh, but but this definition of F map F map is, is here a higher order polymorphic function, right? To use the big language, uh, because it takes a function and produces a function, right? It's polymorphic because it takes a function from A to B. So A is arbitrary, B is arbitrary time, right? Um, <clears throat> but then for every specific functor, like maybe, and we'll see some more functors in a moment, uh, you define a different F map. It's a completely different function, right? So it's not, it's not like you can write one formula for F map for all functors. That doesn't work this way. Okay, so now you are seeing a different kind of polymorphism in which depending on what your um, parameter is, in this case the functor, you, you get a different implementation of a function, F map in this case. So this is an example of ad hoc polymorphism. And in Haskell we have both. We can have ad hoc polymorphism, that's fine. It's just, we, we use a slightly different tool for, for ad hoc polymorphism, which is called a type class. So a type class is, you define a whole family or a class of types that share some common interface. So that's very similar to, you know, like in other object-oriented languages, you have classes or interfaces and they share a function, right? So, <laughs> so in Haskell this is called a class and for instance you can have a class uh, of types that support equality, okay? So that's, that class is called EQ and the type, type, some type A is a member of this class which is written in this, where there is an operator equal equal that takes what? It takes A and A and produces a pool. Right? So and so so every type that supports this kind of operator equality, right? That takes two A's and produces a boolean, meaning is this value equal to this value of the same type? Yes or no? Right? But this is one name for a function, in this case an operator, an infix operator, one name that will serve us for many different types. Right? And its implementation will be different for every type. Right? You, you, dif you implement equality differently for integers, di differently for strings, right? Strings are also a member of the EQ class. But comparing strings means, you know, comparing uh, character by character. And so on. So that's, that's ad hoc polymorphism, which is parameterized here by a type. But with functors, we have a slightly bigger problem because functors are not parameterized by types. 
functors are actually type constructors, right? So maybe is a functor because it takes a type and produces a type. Unfortunately, in Haskell, the same mechanism, class mechanism, works equally well for types, types con type constructors, or even more exotic beasts. <coughs> okay? The compiler will know what to do. It's a very smart compiler. So if we want to define a functor, we'll have to define it as a class. Call it a functor. Give it a name. It has to be a lowercase name because it's a type parameter. In this case, it's type constructor parameter. Where? So this does not specify whether f is a type or type constructor and so on. There is a way of specifying it, but we don't have to because the next line will tell the compiler what we mean. Because the next line says there has to be, f is a functor if there is a function defined for it called fmap, which has the following signature takes a function from A to B and produces a function from FA to FB. And here the compiler says, aha, F, F can act on types, right? Because A is a type here. A is a type, B is a type. Then F must be something that can act on types to produce another type. So F here actually is a type constructor, okay? So the compiler figures this out for us. It's fine. If it sees A and B, does it just say, oh, that must be some uh, universally qualified type? Or yeah, yeah. It's automatically universally quantified, yes, because it's a type variable. Any type variable that's unspecified is automatically universal. It's any type, A, any type B, this must be. This must be. So fmap for a particular functor is a polymorphic function because it works for any A and B. And it's a higher order function because take, it takes a function and produces it. So let me give you more examples of functors so that you can get some feel for what functors are. And then I'll tell you what the intuition is. Maybe I should have started with the intuition for end of functors. I mean, we have the intuition for functors from category theory. I don't know if we can call it the intuition, but you know, mathematically, this is what a functor is. Here's the definition of, of a functor in, in Haskell maybe was an example of a functor. Now, if I start by just listing all these examples of functors, you will say they are all so different. You know, each of them is a completely different thing. So it's really hard to like, develop uh, an intuition what a functor is. Fortunately, a functor is a simple construct. So, so you can always say in one sentence, oh, well, a functor is just a a type constructor that supports fmap. Okay. No, oh, fine. I can I can keep it in my in one cell, in one neuron in my brain, and, and I can work with it. With monads, it's, it's kind of more more difficult because the definition of a monad is is quite a mouthful. So you cannot put it in one neuron in your brain, and this is why people say I don't understand what a monad. Is. So I'll give you uh, some kind of intuition for, for both functor and monad that will fit one neuron. <coughs> but for that, I need uh, a few more examples. And uh, like this, the, the, the most uh, intuitive example of a functor is list. So let's do uh, this is 
this. I mean, lists are built into Haskell, but I'm going to define my own list, right? I mean, we've done this before. List of A, it's, it's a co-product of nil or cons of A and this of A, right? Something you can easily memorize. M, a list of A is either empty or uh, consists of a head and a tail, right? And head of type A, tail is a list. So it's a recursive definition. So the important part is, first of all, it is a type constructor. List is a type constructor. It takes an arbitrary type and creates a list of types of this type, right? So list of integer, list of boolean, and so on. So it is a type constructor. Is this type constructor a functor? Yeah. And obviously it is because it's built using uh, um, algebraic data types but we don't know that yet, right? So we have to do the hard work. So we have to define F map for it. So once we define a class, you know, when we want to say that something is of a particular class, we say it's an instance. So we say instance um, functor this. So list is an instance of functor where, and now we have to prove this by providing an implementation of fmap for this particular type constructor, right? So now it's our proof, fmap. <coughs> so fmap in this case will take a function from A to B and produce a function from list of A to list of B, right? So F, replace it with list list of A, list of B, okay? So, fmap takes a function f, okay, don't confuse this f with this f, please, okay? And uh, it produces a function from list of A to list of B. So let's give this function a list of A's and see how we can produce a list of B's. So there are two possi possibilities here. We give it an empty list, okay? We give it an empty list. What should it produce? An empty list, right? Yeah, nothing to do much. And in fact, in Haskell, if you don't use an argument, you can replace it with an underscore. Like, I don't care what this function is. So the interesting case is you have a function f here and you have a cons. You have a cons of some um, head and tail, right? Where head is of type A, tail is of type list of A, okay? So now you have to think a little bit. Okay, so I have a list of A's, like I have a list of integers, or, or I have a list of apples, and I have a function that turns apples into oranges. How can I apply this function to a list of apples? Well, you just apply this function to every individual apple, and you will get a list of oranges automatically, right? So here I have a list of apples, and I want to apply this function so, so how do I apply it to a, to a list? Well, I'll, I'll apply it to the head. I know how to do that, right? So F acting on, on H. This H is of type A. F is from A to B, right? So, so I can do this easily. Um, uh, okay, now how do I apply uh, this function F to, to tail? Because tail is a list. Well, recursively, right? So I'm, I'm just gonna say, well, this is, this is f map f applied to t, right? 
And this is a shorter list than the one I'm defining it for, right? So every time I, I do this, I will apply fmap to a shorter list. And eventually, I'll, I'll hit the nil case for which I have already defined stuff. So I'm fine, right? So this recursion will, will terminate, right? So now I have this, and I have this. I have to combine it into a, a bigger list using cons. Right? So I'm consing f of a, f acting on h with f acting on the tail. And I'm done. Right? That's the definition of map, isn't it? That's the definition of map. Right. So if I know what the definition of map is, and some of you do, well, like, I could have just said f map equals map. Map is, a, is just a particular implementation of fmap for lists. But lists came earlier before functors, so they already had this map defined. Uh, and it's traditionally called map. So, but it's really fmap. And it makes a list of functors. Okay? Um, what else can we uh, make into? Um, oh, oh, reader, reader. Um, so I'll, I'll be a little cavalier with um, defining the reader functor. So I will just say, um, I will just say type reader of a of, um, let's say, R a equals R A. Okay. What is this? What is this? Well, what I'm saying is, you know, the type construct, the, the arrow itself, well, we haven't talked yet about function types, okay? But we know what a function type is. The function type from A to B, right, is the type of functions that take A as an argument, and return a p, right? The type of p, right? So, um, so, so it is, it is, it is like, like a type constructor, except that it takes two arguments, two types. It takes type, well, I call it r and a here, instead of a and b, right? Because I want to fix this one for a moment, right? So, so it, it is a type constructor, it's, it's a, in a funny way because it's, a, it's an infix, right? But like in Haskell, an infix can always be turned into, right, into a regular uh, thing. So I can say, you know, I can even say this type, I think, reader equals arrow in parentheses. It means it, it takes two types, right? So it, this is the same as saying arrow takes two types, R and A, and produces a type of function from R to A. Okay? So now, so far we were talking about these type constructors that just take one type as an argument, right? And here we have something that takes two types. But we can always just fix one type and say, we only care about the second type, okay? So we fix R, we fix the arrow, and we say, let's just vary A, right? So for every A, we'll get um, a mapping from A so this is our functor, reader, reader r to the type r to a. So this is a functor that takes type a and maps it to type r to a, okay, into a function. Give me a type int. I'll give you a type function from, let's say, r is bool, bool to int. Give me a, uh, give me double, 
I'll give you a function from uh, bool to double, and so on. First one is fixed to bool, let's say, and the second one can vary. So it is a type constructor. It's a type constructor with this arrow with, with the first argument fixed. <coughs> so this is something that in Haskell people do all the time. Right? Um, it, it gets a little bit, you have to get used to it. Right? So, because this is, this is called currying or partial application. Partial application. You have something of two arguments, you fix one argument, and it becomes a function of one argument. Here it's a function on types. You know, a function that takes two types, you can fix one type, and it becomes a function of one type. So I, I want to I wanna say that this is actually a functor in A. Okay? Once you fix R, it becomes a functor in A. So I want to define F map for it. So first I have to think about what, what would the type of F map be in this particular case. So it would take A to B as an argument, right? And then it would produce a function from FA to FB. Now FA, okay, is this guy. So it's really takes a function from R to A. Okay. And in fact, it's, I, I'll, I'll skip these parentheses. These parentheses are not necessary, right? I can say because of currying. Well, we'll talk about currying later, but it's like this is a function that takes this function as an argument that produces this function, okay? So this is a function from R to A. This is a function from R to B. Right? So this is my functor act acting on A. This is my, my functor acting on B. Functor acting on A, functor acting on B. So how can I do this? Well, so F map acting on some F. So let's call this F, right, as before. But now let's call this G. And it produces a function. So G is a function from R to A. F is a function from A to B. And we want to produce a function from R to B. There's only one way of matching these things. Okay, this is called like uh, type Tetris in, in Haskell. <laughs> now there's only one way of, of, to, to match these. Uh, like what is it? Okay, we can go from R to A and then from A to B to get a function from R to B, right? Which means we apply this function after this function. So it's G after F, right? G after F, they match. Miraculously. So I can define F map for it. And in fact, in Haskell, I can, I can be even more clever because I can rewrite this. This is a dot. Dot is an infix operator, but I can write it as a function. Is the order here okay? It's F after G, right? Yeah. I have to draw a picture, okay? So this is A, this is B, this is F. And G is from R to A. This is G. So it is F after G, right? Okay. Still making these mistakes. Always draw pictures. Okay, I always draw pictures. So I can I, I can write this as as the dot operator acting on two arguments f and g, right? <coughs> and uh, I can just 
divide by fg, right? <laughs> <laughs> f map equals dot. And that's totally legitimate in Haskell, right? These two functions are, are, are equal, means applied two arguments, they will give the same result. Here I applied them to f and g, but that just means that these two functions of two arguments are the same. Yes? And what would the instance definition multiply for that? The instance reader R? OK, this is why I didn't want to do this. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it would be easy, uh, except that uh, it won't work for type. I would have to say new type, OK? New type and give it a name of a constructor. Once I give it the name of the constructor, I have to pattern match it here, and then start getting. But but it's a mechanical thing, you know. Yeah. But 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 essentially, f map equals dot um, ca captures the idea, right? In reality, I would have to say here, you know, map this pattern to reader g, and then do f dot g. Read there after two. Yes. Any other questions? Okay, so now it's time to say um, what what is the general intuition behind this? Because I've shown you things that are so different, and I haven't even shown you the the really weird one like the const functor or the identity functor. Okay, we'll talk about these two. Um, but it seems like each of them is, is to totally different, right? But uh, there is one intuition for that, that works for endo functors. Uh, that some people say it is, is, a, is really bad and other people say it's, it's great and I think it's great. Um, and I think the people who say it's bad, they're, they're just sticklers for you know, unnecessary reasons. Um, the, the intuition is that a functor, when it's acting on some type, you know, it actually uh, encapsulates this, the values of this type, somehow hides them, right? So, so uh, an element of, a f of the type functor, f functor of A has elements of A in it, sort of, okay? And something that has something inside is, is usually called a container, right? So I like to think of functors as containers. And some of these functors are like obviously containers, nobody will, right? List list as a container, right? It contains A's. It contains, like a list of integers contains integers, right? That's obviously a container, right? A tree, which is a functor too, right? It is, it is a container of, of objects. Uh, in C++, you know, vector. Uh, in Haskell you have vectors too, right? But, you know, a vector is, is a container of, of elements and, and it's a functor. Uh, and so on, you know. So I mean, whatever container you can you can come up with, it's probably a good functor. Okay. But then there are these functors that uh, are kind of problematic. Like maybe, well, maybe a, it may contain an a, right? But maybe not. Maybe it contains nothing. So. In this way, it kind of generalizes the idea. Well, it contains an A. If it contains an A, then, then it's OK. If it doesn't contain an A, then, you know, it doesn't, right? But it's a container. A container can be empty, right? So I, I guess it kind of works, right? Um, and, 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 uh, and this idea that something is a container also means what does it mean to apply a function to a container? It means just open this container, look at the stuff that's inside the container, and apply this function to this, to the contents, 
of the container, right? So this is what we did with the maybe. We said, well, if it contains nothing, then we do nothing. Fine, right? We can't do anything. But if it contains an A, well, then just apply this function to, to an A. With a list, right? Well, just apply this function to every element of the list, and so on. So, so far, so good, right? Uh, but then we have this reader guy. Okay. How is this a container? And this is where, where the sticklers will say, you see, this, this is not a container. And, um, and I will say, well, isn't it? Like, look at a function that takes a Boolean and returns some other type. Like, how many possible values does this function have? Two, right? The one for true and one for false. So can I say it's a container of two values? A function from Boolean is really a container of two values. And I can make it even more uh, palatable by saying, well, I can memoize this function, right? I can replace it with a table lookup, and, and this table is, is a data types, and it contains these two values, right? Uh, what about the function of integer? Well, a function of integer is, is just a list. It's, it's a sequence of, num of things, right? It's an infinite sequence, but it's a sequence. It's, it's a container that contains these, you know, f of 0, f of 1, f of minus 1, f of 2, f of minus 2, and so on, right? Maybe I cannot memoize the whole thing because it would take uh, infinite storage, but you know, maybe I can partially memoize it and so on. So, so this uh, distinction between a function and a data type, actually, if you think about it, is weak. You know, and then again, you know, you think, okay, like. A list is a container, right? It's a definitely a data type, not a function, right? But then I will ask you, okay, so in Haskell you can say, I have a list from one to infinity. It's a list. Okay, it contains one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on. It's data, right? But obviously I cannot store it in memory because it's infinite. So really, how is this thing implemented internally? It's implemented as a function, right? It will produce the elements. If you, if you ask it for the next element, it will just generate this element, right? So it is a function. And then, in fact, you know, in, in Haskell, all data types really are thunks. They are functions that can be evaluated to return a value. So, data are really functions. Functions are really data. There is no hardcore distinction. And then we will actually talk about what a function type is in category theory, and you will see that it is actually an exponential, which is a data type. Okay? So, so now you understand why I say it's, it's okay to think of functors as containers. And, and you just have to expand your mind to think of containers in, in, a, in a larger, uh, in general way, right? I mean, uh, there is something in, in, in C++ called future. Well, future contains a value that is to be evaluated by some thread going in the background, right? So does a future contain this value? Well, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, because it hasn't finished evaluating, right? But, but you can think of it as a container that contains this value, uh, even if it's, uh, it contains it only virtually, right? But what is the important thing is that you can apply a function to this value. You don't care whether this value has been evaluated yet or not. If it's been evaluated, then, you know, maybe it will apply this function immediately. 
If it hasn't been, it will just memoize this function, remember it for later, right? And then apply it when the value arrives, right? So the only thing about a functor that's important is that you can apply a function to what it contains. There is no way, at least the functor does not provide you a way of retrieving this value. That's not part of the definition of a functor, right? So, so in this sense, you don't know whether this value is there or isn't it. All you know is that you can operate on this value, you know? Like, this is radioactive value, right? You have the gloves, you put it there, and you operate on this. You can never take it out because you die, right? <laughs> so there can be a functor like this. Is it a container? Well, yeah, I think it is a container. So, I want to leave you with this idea that functors and all functors are containers. Okay? Once you think about this, you know, operate, operating, dealing with functors, using functors becomes much, much easier. Okay? Thank you. <laughs>